What is the solution? From the book Do-It-Yourself City Church Restoration from fellowshipofthemartyrs.com We need new wineskins. We need to be corporately transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12, 1 and 2 We don't need to invent some new system. A true new wineskin isn't a megachurch with really excellent childcare and fancy shows. That's not resulting in radical transformation of economies and ecologies and taking back the culture. Transfer growth and massive budgets spent on discretionary things aren't going to get this done. We have to be rebooted. We have to be renewed, set back to the defaults, back to our first love. Things have to be put back into divine order, the way they were intended from the beginning. And that means the city churches. That is the new wineskin. That is the greatest challenge for us to face, will require the most Holy Spirit, is the most dangerous thing to the enemy, and will prove our love for each other to the world in ways we can't even comprehend right now. That kind of community and sharing with each as they have a need is a true witness to what Christianity can and should be. Our endless divisions and factions are not. Again, a city church is not a matter of creating some new organization. If there are Christians in your town, then there is a church of your town, and there always has been. Odds are that the body in your town is filled with all kinds of things that grieve God and will keep you corporately from inheriting the kingdom right now. Galatians 5, 19-21, Deuteronomy 28. It's just a matter of following the biblical prescriptions and getting it washed clean, and then getting it filled with Jesus instead. It's a matter of confessing your sins and the sins of your fathers and forefathers, and asking Him to do whatever it takes to show up and direct the affairs of this stiff-necked people. You have to ask Him to restore the lampstand, because you've almost surely lost it generations ago. America has been dark for a really long time. Revelation 2, 1 through 7 in the King James. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which they say are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. End quote. The love mentioned there is agape. Their former agape was cold. Surely that was affecting their own bonds of harmony. Surely some of them were going their own way. They were commended because they were patient, and had not fainted, and they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But still they had lost their first love. Perhaps their focus had gotten diverted to all the things coming against them, and not on the love of their Lord and for each other. But at least they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, not the people themselves, mind you, their deeds. See Psalm 141, 5 and 6. But who were the Nicolaitans? Some say they were a cult formed around a leader, Nicholas. Whether that is the deacon Nicholas or not, no one really knows. It may be that it's not a name, but a description of the main theology of the group that it was transliterated instead of translated. The word itself is from the Greek nikao, which means to conquer or overcome, and laos, which means people, and from which the word laity comes. Together they mean destruction of the people, and refers to the earliest form of a priest class or clergy that lorded it over the people. This divided the people and set up some who had the deep mysteries as more holy or more powerful or responsible to direct the affairs of others. That is decidedly against the truth, that we are all priests and kings, and none is greater than any other. We are to lean not on our own understanding, or that of any other man. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Only Jesus gets to direct all of our paths. A good translation of Nicolaitan would be those who prevail over the people. This clergy system would later turn into the papal hierarchy of the Catholic Church. The Council of Trent stated, quote, if anyone shall say that there is not in the Catholic Church a hierarchy established by the divine ordination consisting of bishops, presbyters, and ministers, let him be anathema. End quote. 
that means cursed and excommunicated the reformers may have changed some things about the catholic church but they were very careful not to disrupt the hierarchy that empowered them as well as the catholics it was a reformation that addressed all the inconsequential issues and left alone the things that would have really done some damage to the forces of darkness it brought more division didn't restore the city churches and didn't eliminate the priest class but there were always those in the woods who remained true and were actively hunted by the catholic church and her daughters do you know how many people luther and calvin had burned at the stake look it up those who were appointed by god to serve apostles prophets evangelists pastors teachers are not to lord it over the people they are gifts to the church to serve to lead by the examples of their holy and broken and submitted lives not to boss people around and legislate behavior that is just stepping into the role set for god and god alone no man should be directing our paths only god through his spirit gets to direct us until the church learns this and the pyramidal hierarchical system comes crashing down and gets inverted to its proper form we cannot march shoulder to shoulder without jostling each other here is what the matthew henry concise commentary says about this passage Quote, these churches were in such different states as to purity of doctrine and the power of godliness that the words of christ to them will always suit the cases of other churches and professors christ knows and observes their state though in heaven yet he walks in the midst of his churches on earth observing what is wrong in them and what they want the church of ephesus is commended for diligence in duty christ keeps an account of every hour's work his servants do for him and their labor shall not be in vain in the lord but it is not enough that we are diligent there must be bearing patience and there must be waiting patience and though we must show all meekness to all men yet we must show just zeal against their sins the sin christ charged this church with is not the having left and forsaken the object of love but having lost the fervent degree of it that at first appeared christ is displeased with his people when he sees them grow remiss and cold toward him surely this mention in scripture of christians forsaking their first love reproves those who speak of it with carelessness and thus try to excuse indifference and sloth in themselves and others our savior considered this indifference as sinful they must repent they must be grieved and ashamed for their sinful declining and humbly confess it in the sight of god they must endeavor to recover their first zeal they must endeavor to recover their first zeal tenderness and seriousness and must pray as earnestly and watch as diligently as when they first set out in the ways of god if the presence of christ's grace and spirit is slighted we may expect the presence of his displeasure encouraging mention is made of what was good among them indifference as to truth and error good and evil may be called charity and meekness but it is not so and it is displeasing to christ the christian life is a warfare against sin satan the world and the flesh we must never yield to our spiritual enemies and then we shall have a glorious triumph and reward all who persevere shall derive from christ as the tree of life perfection and confirmation in holiness and happiness not in the earthly paradise but in the heavenly this is a figurative expression taken from the account of the garden of eden denoting the pure satisfactory and eternal joys of heaven and the looking forward to them in this world by faith communion with christ and the consolations of the holy spirit believers take your wrestling life here and expect and look for a quieter life hereafter but not till then the word of god never promises quietness and complete freedom from conflict here matthew henry concise end quote continued in part two for more on this see www.fellowshipofthemartyrs.com